Yes, I am uh, Caleb Chung, um, and uh, it's just kind of a strange name. Uh, my mother's uh, German, my father's Chinese, so I'm kind of bifurcated. I think the Dick Cavett, Dick Cavett joke was, uh, an hour later, you're hungry for power, I think was the... <laughs> so on that... <laughs> so on that, I'm going to... Uh, play a little uh, demo video that I used to always show when I would go to toy companies and beg them to license my products. And uh, as you all know, um, it's kind of difficult to place items, uh, or maybe you don't know, but you'll, you'll, I'll comment through this. So we're going to go ahead and start this video, see if this works. Giving Toys was the, uh, is the name of my uh, company. And let's see if we get the audio. Okay. This is the uh, hamburger maker for Mattel. They said, uh, we want to make uh, little realistic hamburgers that you can eat. There's a fry maker, and that would make uh, little french fries that you could eat out of a pasta maker. And here is a cookie maker. And this is the cookie maker and the McNugget maker. This is uh, my daughter at the time when she was pretty young testing the apple pie maker. So you go like that, it looks like a real apple pie, and she really puts that away, doesn't she? <laughs> She's about 300 pounds now. That's what they look like when they came out in the stores, about a $50 million product line. So now we have a little montage, you know? I, I left Mattel, and I said, okay, I'm gonna go strike out on my own. They didn't, that didn't sell. The, this uh, was a squishy head that I tried to sell to Nerf, and they didn't want that. Oh, this was uh, robotics. I started to do robotics. I used to be in the effects industry as well. You see me controlling it. That, that, that didn't last long either. Oh, walking Barbie. Cool idea. Sorry, we don't want walking Barbie. These are really cool fighting robots. They can, they can wrestle. They can get back up. I took it to, uh, to the right people, and they took it to Toy Fair, and then they said it's dead. So they are cool. Oh, here's my little pug. We're product testing with my little pug. <laughs> See the little phone connectors? There we are. The albums date me. My kids go, what is that thing? This is a, a clay animator. Took this to, um, you know, to Play-Doh, and they said, no, we don't. No, that another Lego product. A lot of hit and miss in this business. I animated Legos. I thought that would be so cool. This is like 10 years before, you know, the, uh, the smart. There's my first dinosaur. Negro Ponte saw this. Says, this is great, you know, and Mattel said, uh, we don't want that. Uh, can you make two that fight each other? You know, like tear their skin off. So I made two, and they said, oh, there's, it's not interesting. Anymore. Oh, then I did a fishing pole, and then this is where I peaked in my career, right? About, you know who that is, right? That was a long time ago. This was a segment called Dangerous Toys You Won't See at Christmas. We had my first saw blade launcher. We had battling blimps, and we almost got fired. Yeah. Go get them, Dave. This was uh, M.E.K. going through a, a Volkswagen motor. So this is just a little quick segment. Um, I, I used to be an actor, and before I was an actor, I was a street mime. And before I was a street mime, I... Anyway, this was a, a pilot for a TV show. This guy's Dr. Yachts. And the idea, it was before, you know, the science guy, and he would take apart toys and see the Nintendo's parallel processing over there, and a guy named Stan Reznikoff put this together. We won some awards, but we never got the show. That's a helicopter he's flying. See, there's a little view right there. It's really a steady cam, but... So this is where my acting career really ended. See, I have a keyboard strapped to my arm, though. I was ahead of my time. This is off. Man, I'm thin. I love toys. Thank you. That was, uh, that was just to get you in the mood. So that's, um, that's, that's toy design. Thank you for the spontaneous applause. Thank you. Wow, that works. Green means clap, right? Has the thing come up. So um, I'm going to try to segue into a little bit of learning that I did about toy design. Then I'm going to show you two quick products. I have way too many slides, and then I'm going to bring out my new guy. But um, let's see if this, you guys know how this works, right? I push the button. There's a monkey over there who pushes a button. That's really, it's, it's not a monkey, but, but it's what happens. So 
um, there's two elements in my life that keep coming back and keep getting blended. Uh, one is art, and the other is science. And I've come to think of these as beauty and magic. And I've heard a lot of people talking, and I'm just so humbled to be here and, and hear all these, these, these brilliant people speak. I, this is my own little view of the world here, and it, I think it's replicated by a lot of what other people have, have been studying. But art is, is the human side. The beauty is the human side. It's, it's emotion. It's... Um, creativity, it, it's everything to do with, with why, why we do things. Science is the technology of the day. So science is like this powerful genie that can do anything but has no idea what to do and often makes things we don't want. So you really need to blend these two things together. And um, that's, that's kind of my little pictogram of how it works. You need this dynamic balance between science and art. And that, I think, is, is kind of the seed of innovation. If you get those two things to work together, and toys do that uh, uh, constantly, try to get the art and the science to work together, then you have the seed of innovation. Then you need to plant that seed in a fertile soil so it'll grow. Otherwise, you have this great idea that never goes anywhere. And that's why we have the, the business there. So there is my little mandala of, of, of success. You know, that's, and I'm working on um, some enterprises that, uh, that help um, articulate how to arrive at innovation and then foster that. So what next I'm going to do is tell you the Furby tale. All right, now, Furby, um, don't throw anything. There is an invisible wall here, so <laughs> all of you. This is the Furby tale. Um, what happened back in 1997, I went to Toy Fair with a friend of mine, Dave Hampton, electronics guy. I was the art. He was the science. And uh, we looked at everything we saw there, and we decided uh, nothing was that interesting, so let's do something together. So um, we went back to the hotel room, and I said, Dave, what do you want to do? And Dave, uh, Dave said, oh, there's my family. There they are. That's uh, my wife, Christy. Uh, Emily, who's 17, who's just a big bunch of trouble. There's uh, me, Abigail, and Melissa. And I actually did Furby for the little one in the middle there. So um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I want to talk about animatronics. I used to be in the movie industry, and I would build these little creatures. I've always had a, a real love of trying to bring things to life. So this was the first thing I ever built was, was a robotic dinosaur. This is the little dinosaur you saw before. This is mechanisms. I, I, I basically went to Mattel and kind of, it was toy college for me. Um, I learned a lot. I'm hacking servos here. Uh, there's another dinosaur with, with uh, He-Man Skeletor legs, I think. That's on there. Um, same thing again. Little Pony. Hasbro said, hey, we want a Little Pony. Wouldn't that be good for the Little, little Pony line? I said, uh, can I put a motor into the... So this guy, they just wanted to move its head, but he walked all around the table and stuff, and they loved it, and then they didn't do it. So, <laughs> so I decided uh, with Dave that we were going to use a single motor. We are going to use a single motor to do our next product together, because every time you do something with a lot of motors, they say, can you do it for two? How about one? How about a wind-up? How about a stuffed animal? And pretty soon, you're, you're not building anything. So I said, okay. One motor. You can't, you, can't, you can't touch me. 30 cents. If I can make, if I can make something come alive for a 30 cent motor, then, then we're there. So I have these design books, and there's the first page in the design book, Fur Ball. We didn't know what it was going to be. Why this product? So I got, you know, the how over there. Science is the how, is a how to do things, and here's the psychology, and, and I always write and write and write and, and dredge up all these things until I have the product. Uh, then it just goes kind of chronologically through the design process, and uh, there's some pseudocode. I'm not really a programmer, but I play one on TV. Then, uh, then here's the first part of Furby. Didn't have any mouth or eyes. Uh, I mean, anything other than eyes. And over here we have the, uh, oh, I don't know what that is. This is old stuff. Um, then starting with a mechanism over here, more mechanism, and then uh, more mechanism. Big list of mechanical design product issues. Okay. Wait. OK, there's how I'm going to use one motor. I'm going to use one motor like a music box with feedback to the processor, and it's going to know where it is all the time. I'm going to have this linear expression profile. Right? So big patent. It worked really well. Um, and then I'm getting more serious. This is how all the projects go on. I'm getting more serious. And then see my little note to self on the top there? Lots of engineering. <laughs> <laughs> but the first ones, there's my exploded view. The first ones I do all by myself in my garage. right? So. Then I go in the garage, and Dad's in the, in, the, in the garage again, and I just start gluing my fingers together and cutting myself. <laughs> so then I, uh, I built the first little camshaft right there. There it is, little tiny camshaft. And what happens is there's Furby on the half shell. When the motor, <laughs> the, you see this little box here? That's my tilt sensor. That's a BB in a box. You think I could buy, buy a tilt sensor. And then there's a friction wheel to the main gear that makes it quiet, and then a worm gear up to the camshaft. And then uh, there's the inside of the head. And 
There's the back of Furby, and I'm done. Look, there he is. Little, little robot on acid. Yeah. <laughs> I love this part. I, I thought this was done, and, and uh, my wife goes, uh, that's cute, but no one's going to want that. So um, my wife, Christia, I can never say enough about her. She's my, my partner for life. She comes to the rescue, and she says, okay, we're going to do some drawings. And she actually went to design school, and she said, okay, we're going to make these coloring books. We're going to come up with different color patterns. We're going to do, I like the one with the cigar, actually. <laughs> the, uh, how you doing? I'm Furby. What's your problem, huh? Okay, so, <laughs> you're looking at me. All right, so she did renderings of what Furby could look like. Now, back then, Beanie Babies were hot, and we said, oh, we could have all these, these different ones. So we were, you know, there's a cute little pink one. There's a, there's, oh, this was, this, they had a product problem with that. I can't remember what the safety issue was. <laughs> the, uh, the, this, you know, I show this to kids, the boys go, yeah! This is, this is the inner Furby, actually. And then we finally decided on this look. So um, I, I had to fur it up and make it look real for the prototype that we were going to try to license. So I went to Toys R Us, bought a little furry little kitty, and, and ripped its skin off. And, there, <laughs> and there's the little bush baby caught in the headlights. We, we don't, I didn't have eyelids at this point, so he's, he's like this. So, um, so now, OK, we show it to Tiger Electronics, and they go, we really want to do this, uh, but, but you guys are going to develop it. And I'm going, oh, you know, we got 11 weeks or whatever it is, and no, no, you're going to manage it. And I'm going, that's a mistake. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a really a bad, I'm good at doing this, but in terms of managing other people, I'm, I'm usually not very good. So anyway, I started right in, because what did I know? And, and I started doing all the mechanical designs, and I'm not an engineer, so they, they get what they paid for. And uh, <laughs> So back then, we actually, um, we were just getting rapid prototyping. I mean, back in 97, there were, like, GM had a plant. That was it. So the only way I could get this done on what they were paying me, I had, like, $5,000 to do, like, you know, 10 prototypes, and it would cost, you know, $30,000 to do one. I call up a friend who knew a friend who was, ran the GM plant, uh, and they were down for the while, so they, they said, well, we'll just build those for you. So they built all the SLA parts for me. And then uh, that was nice of them. They're still, oh, so that's what they look like uh, when we got fur on them, and, and we're still using these giant Garfield eyes. Um, and that, yes, you, that's, it's cool, huh? I like that guy. Right, there they are. And they were actually uh, in, in uh, Time Magazine at Toy Fair. Um, and then uh, eight months later, you may remember this. I like this guy down here. I think this, must have. We made them. Tiger made them as fast as they could. They'd just been bought by Hasbro on the day of Toy Fair. But they wound up doing uh, 40 million units. They sold 40 million units worldwide, which is, I can't even imagine. What's, they were doing 2 million a month. That's like a Furby cannon, you know? I went to Asia, you know, I'm like, you know, because, you know, they have lines that go into infinity with people going, I hate this thing, you know? <laughs> there he is! <laughs> So full circle, why am I at a toy designer? Because, you know, you're doing this for your kids, really. And they're, oh, it's just so cute. So that's, anyway, so that's uh, Abby with, uh, with the Furbies. So um, now we're going to do the next one, and I'm going as fast as I can. I'm, I'm, and I'm, that's pretty fast. So if you're taping this, we can slow it down to human time later. Pleo. Pleo is, uh, so I retired, made a bunch of money, retired, and, um, and, just, and, and I'm going, okay, hey, this is cool. Well, this is fun, yeah, I'm retired. Yeah, that's good. It's great. OK, what are we going to do? You know, so I, I, I started on another project uh, about four years ago. And it was, hey, let's do that dinosaur. Remember that dinosaur product you know, that we never got off? So the idea is we're going to create a real life form. I mean, it's crazy. You know, this is Jurassic Park. We're going to try to replicate a real baby dinosaur. Let's, let's see what we can do that. We got some money in the car here. Let's go, let's go try that. And, um, and the idea is. Yet I can just show you, like, this is, this is the idea of, of you have this thing, you go, and there's that moment of wonder where it comes to life, and you realize you're, you're on the right road to making something that is, that'll move people, that they will have empathy for. And, and people ask me, why, did, why are you doing this at all? And so they asked me an interview just a little while ago, and I said, well, it's because humans need empathy. They need to feel empathy. They, they need to love something. They need that. We don't have that enough in our world. And, and if you've had a family pet or something, you, you can't have it at the office, and kids in hospitals can't have them. And, and you know, it's just there's, I think uh, there is a place for, for these 
these new life forms in our society. And I think they do serve a real purpose for uh, humanity. Anyway, enough, enough of that. How do you make a dinosaur? So we, we picked a Camarasaurus, or I picked a Camarasaurus at this point. There weren't that many other people around in the company. And I picked a Camarasaurus. <laughs> I picked this dinosaur specifically because it was the most, um, it, there were more of them than anything else, and they found a full skeleton so I could start to measure it and kind of figure out what it would actually look like. And so there was a book called um, Walking on Eggshells. Uh, in Patagonia, they found actual sauropod skin out of an egg. So I said, that's the skin texture I want. I'm completely obsessive. So then I said, okay, there's, there's a body. I've shortened the legs a little bit, but that's the Camarasaurus skeleton. Let's measure this sucker and see if we can copy the geometry. And so, you know, what do I know? I, I start going. So uh, I get the motor. I figure out what, what it's going to look like and, and, you know, where the batteries are going to go and, and then, you know, how to do the mechanism. And, and then here's how... So at this point, um, uh, you know, this guy, Bob Christopher, comes in. He's the CEO. He starts raising money like you can't believe. I mean, he's like, you know, he, I saw him raise, what was it? half a million dollars in five minutes or something. You know, I'm like, how does this work? Anyway, he's just that guy. He's, hi, Bob, here's some money. You know, he's just that guy. I don't know, he's amazing. D doesn't look like he's doing anything either. You know, we're like, can I have some money? He's like, thank you. So, I don't know, it's, it's magic. So, um, so this is the skeleton. So we're trying to do biomimicry, right? Because I, I figure if I copy as much as I can, I'll have a good chance that this thing will, will have some of the same stuff. Um, so then you have to sketch on top of it, and then you have to figure out, well, what mechanism is going to go in there, and then you have to hire other guys that come in and do the CAD, and you start doing the, the mechanical design. Then you do the SLAs, and this is just a simplified version, and the motor and the gears and all this stuff, and then, and then you, you do more and you do more, and then you have a, a bad out-of-focus picture of one, and there's a, that's a photorealistic eye on him. We took a lot of time on the eye. And there's one of the exploded views of, uh, of, of Pleo. And there's the first SLA. He already has kind of a character. The, the thing is, we had to redesign all the motors so they actually fit within the muscle packages and make the hips the right uh, you know, ratio on the head and, and all this stuff. It took, took a long time. So um, we're, we're actually have some big partners in Asia now. Um, you've heard of the company Foxconn, right? They're, they're a $50 billion you know, manufacturer. They said this is the hardest product they've ever seen. They do all the Apple products. They, they do everything. So they're, uh, I don't know if that's good to say, but you know. <laughs> Ooh, I confused them. Okay, so, so <laughs> yeah, I stumped the genie. All right, so, um, so now you can see, now we go back and we try to say, okay, how do we make this a character? We got the, the mechanism kind of in the right shape. Uh, and so he has that extra hump on his butt. So he said, oh, let's stick a speaker in there. Um, and then we, it took a long time actually to come up with a character. Character design is, 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 is a real hassle. Uh, so here was the first kind of a uh, Pleo guy. Um, then we're not done because now we've got to sculpt the skin. And if you imagine you've got this mechanism, then you've got to make a, a giant mold that's going to have the skin. That, it's just it's very complicated. But the sculpting itself was crazy. Look, see that we've got a, a, a dino sculptor, and those are actually spoon-shaped teeth. That's the shape they think their tongue was. I mean, we went nuts on, on realism. This guy sculpts for the uh, La Brea um, tar pits, those, a lot of the stuff in the museum there. So the dew claw, all that stuff. So then you sculpt, and 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 you fire the sculpt, and you hire another sculptor. And then... And then you're all done, then you send it to Asia, and they have to s scale it up three times and then scale it down so all your work goes away. But, um, but so there, and now, um, let's see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ouch. No, it wasn't my money, though. See, I, I learned something. Um, and then 59 seconds. Um, hmm? Keep going. Keep going. 59 seconds. Four, three, two. Okay, wait. Okay, so, uh, so. He said keep going. Keep going. Keep going. This is a promotional video. <laughs> there's, a sales, there's a sales pitch at the end. Oh, okay, now you'll like this. Wake up. Leo, wake up, Leo. Come on. Come on, wake up, wake up. Hi, I'm Caleb Chung, and Pleo is on the move. Um, you go be itself means you go become. The whole idea is we want to bring things to life. Our look at view of the world is imagination today is reality tomorrow. I'm Bob Christopher, co-founder and CEO 
of Yagobi. And this is Pleo, who's now alive. Yagobi is about recreating life and giving people the opportunity to have an experience with our life forms. Right, Pleo? Caleb showed me his original invention for Pleo. When I first saw the video of the four-legged robot walking, I was amazed. I literally was a jaw-dropping moment for me. It was the aha moment that we have something here that is gonna change robotics and, and the world. Looking around, waving. Yugobi's life forms are based on the three laws of robotics. The first is all we life forms them. must feel and convey emotions. It's important for our life forms to show you how they feel, what they're thinking, how they are reacting to something. Second is all life forms must be aware of themselves and their environment. They must be aware the lights are on, there's a loud noise, you're close by, something is happening in their world. The third law is all life forms must evolve over time. They must adapt and evolve and change as real creatures do. So these are the three laws of all life forms which make up the magic of the experience between people and Cleo. Bringing Cleo to life is all about blending art and science. We've all seen the technology, the science part of Cleo, the motors, the gears, the software. But what you really react to is the art, is the human side. The technology becomes transparent and you're left with a character that you can fall in love with. And that's Cleo. And Pleo's on the move. Thank you. So this is uh, this is Pleo right here. He's a, a, a beta unit still, um, but he's uh, he's he's pretty functional. He's got. Uh, 37 sensors, something like that, 14 motors, seven microcontrollers. Um, it goes on and on and on. What, let's see if we can put them here. Sorry, is that your, that's your presentation? Anyway, uh, <laughs> eat it, Pleo. Um, so uh, he senses uh, sight and sound, and, and he changes over time, all, all the things we'd hoped for. And most people, when they see Pleo, uh, he, you know, this is weird. See what he's doing? The, you see, he's got a capacitive touch sensor like your iPod, but it only responds to human touch because we're antennas. But for some reason, he always nuzzles laptops because there's, he always goes, goes mommy. Like, he's listening to me, see? He's listening to me. He's, he's got binaural hearing. What, do you see me? Yeah, see? Yeah. So he's, he's a, uh, let's see. Pleo, do you see the money? Do you see the money, Pleo? You smell it? Good, good. Oh, you hungry? There you go. This is, uh, this is very realistic in terms of what our investors feel is going on. They... <laughs> just eat, eat, eat. That's, why, that's why he's green. That's why Pleo is the color of money, yes. And uh, so he's sniffing for it. So, um, and he walks around, but yes, I'm not going to do it anymore. Okay, I'll be quiet. So he, you can see he's, he's all his, uh, no, no, he can't hear me, but you can't not talk to him. Okay. <laughs> So um, I'm going to have him around during, during, during the, uh, come on, you feel my, my hand touching you there? You're doing too much other stuff. I got your leg. 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 No, no, I got your leg right here. I got it. I got it. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, I guess that's all I have. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah.